I've spent the last 15 years working as a chef in Europe, developing my practice at restaurants like Noma in Copenhagen and Bastable back here at home in Dublin. Yeah, it's delicious. Yeah, super nice. Wild food and preservation form the basis of my approach, and it's become very clear to me that working sustainably is the only viable future for the food and drink industry. I feel like a three-year-old. This is a hip rose. Children used to put them down uh, other people's backs because they're, they become incredibly itchy. <laughs> in this episode of Sust, I'm going to meet with some fellow professionals in the space to find out what sustainability means to them and see how their businesses are making a difference. The best side out. <laughs> <laughs> First up, some coffee. I'm heading to a cafe in the IFSC owned by Carl Purdy, who set up Coffee Angel from the back of a van in Hoth in 2004. Its success has brought five outlets in Dublin city centre, with Carl taking learnings along the way from his first cafe in Belfast, which was a roaring success, and a restaurant in Dublin, which was not so successful. So the perfect person to chat to about setting up a sustainable food business. With myself at the moment, I'm at a stage of transition. I'm opening a restaurant and Congrats. you probably think I'm crazy having, oh. having just you know no better man I've uh, been through it but um, yeah no it's it's something I'm really really excited about too um, it's something I've wanted to do since I was 15 years old yeah. I think we have a responsibility now to look at you know while building a restaurant the uh, materials and as an operating business how do you how do you kind of look at those responsibilities and, and bring that forward there's so many things about our business that that, that can be improved. I'm a huge, huge believer in not ticking boxes. Yeah, how, how to make that earnest. I think it's important. You, yeah. In order to do it correctly, you have, it has to you know, mean something, right? Absolutely. And I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of catchphrases, things out there today which, which sound great. For us, I think we, we, we try to stay true to doing things that actually do make, make a difference. And we have the choices of getting recyclable cups or compostable cups. And for where we are, we're, we're in the city centre and, and to me going with compostable cups whilst, you know, whilst it may be a good idea, it's not really practical for where we are. It's kind of ticking a box that, that I shouldn't say doesn't need ticking, it just can't be ticked. There's no, there's no composting infrastructure within the city, yeah. within, within the country yeah. um, on, a, on a commercial level. The retail coffee bags that you you know you take mm -hmm. home and you open up and you know you do your thing. Traditionally, they've always had like a foil lining and kind of paper or plastic on the outside and a zipper and a little valve for CO2 to escape. And there's there's a lot of products on the market that are compostable. And we wanted to transition to to something again that was more more sustainable. So we we have been working with our our coffee roaster in Belfast on this project since 2019. And we got in as many of the compostable materials as we could get. Right. Right? And we thought, okay, let's, let's test these. You know, we're, not, we're not gonna trust that you say it's compostable. We wanna know that it's compostable. Okay. And in my head, compostable means a customer buys it, and they use it, finish it, and do the responsible thing, which is put it into their brown bin. So we, we got some of these materials in and we buried them. And we went back six months later, and they were exactly the same. No change. No, no degradation, they were dirty, but they were exactly as we'd put them in. So um, we went back to the companies and, and asked. So well, you told us these were wow. compostable, biodegradable. And they're like, well, they are. And I said, well, no, we buried them for six months and they're, they're exactly the same. There are three layers which would need to be mechanically separated. They would then need to be broken into microscopic pieces and then put into a solution in a temperature stable environment enabled to compost. Yeah. And I'm like, well, nobody can do that. Yeah. You know, whilst technically they're compostable, practically they're not. So for me, that was a, you know, that was a box that we just couldn't tick yeah. in terms of making that promise to people. So we spent a couple of years and we finally found uh, a brand new material. It's called a mono material. Um, and it is 100% recyclable from the ink that's on it, from the zipper on the bag, from the, the valve that releases CO2. Customers can buy these, use them, and put them straight into their green bin, and they will be 100% recyclable. Is it the best solution? No, but buying a compostable material that doesn't, that most people can't compost, is you know, it's kind of ticking a box that 
yeah. that, that isn't legitimate as far as I'm concerned. From our perspective, it's being honest with ourselves. Yeah, that honesty, it's a, yeah. a pro proactive honesty. I mean, you're really researching yeah. um, and asking questions, which I think is really important yeah. because you can't just take everything for granted, I guess. It's, it's, uh, there's real commitment there. You're not out of touch. <laughs> you got it. You still got it. Still got it. <laughs> Carl's success story with Coffee Angel is made even more impressive by his commitment to sustainable values as the business has grown. From my perspective, you know, balancing and managing the, the business health, the profitability and, and managing sustainability, they don't necessarily need to be these two, two philosophies or concepts that are in, in conflict. And I think a lot of what makes our business successful is that we've, we've kind of tied them together in, in some way. Everything from, you know, um, a grinder that dispenses exactly what you need, uh, you know, as opposed to kind of stuff being wasted. Um, we have a, you know, a machine here, the Uber Milk, which dispenses exactly the right amount of milk uh, at the right temperature, at the right consistency, so that, you know, we're not dumping milk down, down the drain. Saving that energy, how does that affect your business? That's a, one of those real passive improvements that we made. Because power supply it's you know it's not the sexy part of my business and it was always something that I it was very nebulous you know you, conventionally it was nebulous and the, the, the Penergy guys came in and they kind of opened their their laptops and said okay well we'll show you your energy usage you have a very clear graph of your energy usage on a daily basis and if you see the bar shooting up at three o'clock in the morning you know that something is wrong right you know what is it exactly that may have been going off or you know something that you um, some, something unforeseen yeah I mean we've got a little smarter over the years in terms of you know we install timers so that things people don't forget things but you know there are things that you can't put timers on you know there's always going to be energy usage there's always going to be fridges that are maintaining temperature but you know big hydro machines coffee machines or boilers or ovens those kind of things shouldn't be left on, they don't need to be left on. A lot of that is what's helped us grow, is, you know, is, is looking for the little wins, um, you know, not losing sight of the bigger picture in terms of customers are people and we need to make them happy and we need to be good at our job, we need to focus on quality, but behind the scenes, the stuff that your team shouldn't really have to worry about, those are, those are I think that's my job now, is, is making sure that their, their jobs are easier and that I can cherry pick the little wins where I can find them and, and something like Pinergy, you know, that's an easy win. Before moving into bricks and mortar, Carl brought his coffee van from Hoth to a spot just by the Shauna Casey Bridge. We strolled by on our way to Coffee Angel on South Anne Street, where I met Carl's wife and business partner, Caroline. She filled me in on more of the details of their sustainability project, starting with their business response to a 2019 government campaign against single-use plastics. What we did is every time a customer of ours used a reusable cup in one of our shops, we donated on their behalf 20 cents to Friends of the Earth Ireland. Wow. So in the course of two and a half years, we were able to raise nearly 12,000 euros and keep about 60,000 single-use cups out of landfill and um, that money was put all towards uh, projects in Ireland, environmental projects in Ireland. But the one that I'm really proud of is called For the Love of Solar. And basically with that, we were able to put solar panels on schools across Ireland, helping them to become more sustainable and environmentally friendly. I guess we all have our own responsibility <laughs> to you know, make a difference, make an impact. And are there any other ways that you guys have, have looked to you know, create that? We decided to move to oat milk, which is a much much more friendly on, on the environment. It's a lot more user-friendly, both in terms of water usage, CO2 emissions, and energy usage. And so we cut out almond milk, and we don't offer anything else. At the beginning, our customers were kind of like querying and questioning why we didn't have one, maybe two, even three alternatives. But once we explained that, they, yeah. they totally embraced it. It's very clear that you guys keep trying to innovate and, and, and improve and look at new solutions. <laughs> Um, to progress into the future, it's, it's really amazing. When you have children, and we have a daughter who's 14, and I mean, for her, the environment is a huge thing. And, you know, she comes into the shops, she worked here um, over the summer, and she comes home with lots of ideas as well. Because when, as a boss and as a business owner, your child asks you, what is your company doing to make my future and our world better? you need to be able to answer <laughs> and answer with conviction and say this is exactly what we're doing and these are the results of what we've done. 
From the city centre to a warehouse in North Dublin, I'm off to meet Fergus Halpin. After returning to Ireland from Australia at the start of the pandemic, he set up Harvest Day with a mission to bring local and organic produce, particularly vegetables, to subscribers all over Ireland. I really wanted to do something where I could basically spend my week speaking to farmers and go and visit farms and from that I was like well why don't I try and bring that produce to to people's homes and try make that produce more accessible. We try work off a zero waste model so customers place their orders with us we close orders for example we'll close them at 8am on Tuesday we then send orders out to all of our farmers saying we need x amount of carrots x amount of broccoli whatever it may be those farmers then harvest the produce for us specifically for us and to the piece, then the produce is either delivered in here by them or we have a number of vans on the road who will go and visit a couple of different farms, pick up the produce and then bring it back into our, our facility here to, to get the boxes made. Fergus tends to work with farmers who grow seasonally. What's in the boxes changes throughout the year, which keeps me on my toes when planning the week's menu. You can almost look forward to what's, what's coming. Exactly. You know, in cooking within season, you're, you're using produce at its best at its most flavorful. It's exciting for us as well, like when, when we hear from a farmer and they say, hey, in two weeks time, we're gonna have this new crop and it's the first of the season. Right. Um, if we were building a box every week of the same produce, it would get pretty boring pretty Definitely. quickly. So, yeah. um, but like, here's a good example. Like these are some, some beautiful cherry tomatoes. Like this is really the last week of them. The hot weather has meant we've had them for a little bit longer, but we won't see these now until next June. And we won't be putting any imported tomatoes in our box. Right. Can I try one? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, they're really good. Um, yeah, you won't see these until there's a customer. The there's a customer now going to get two less. Yeah, actually, we're going to have to change this box around. Later on today, we're going to be going down to visit Dermot. This is kind of one of the more uh, unusual Romanesco, veg. Yeah. yeah, the Romanesco broccoli or cauliflower, depending on who you speak to. We call it Romanesco cauliflower. Um, it does. It has more of a cauliflower flavour, I, I think, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. And I think how you cook it is, is closer to a cauliflower as well. The variety and quality of the produce proves what's possible for Irish growers. And it was great to hear from Fergus that more and more young farmers are getting in touch and looking to work with him. Larkins Hill, who are a great example of, of a farm that we work closely with, who used to stand at the farmer's market, but they still get the same buzz by selling produce to us because the customers we're sending the box to know that this leek is from, from their farm or this spring onion is from their farm. And they get tagged on Instagram when customers receive their box and go, oh my God, this leek from, from Larkins Hill is so beautiful. Mm. So it's, it's just another way for, for people to to sell their produce, but still have that connection with the end consumer. So you guys essentially see yourselves as the link, you know, bridging that, you know, and, and making it accessible and making making it possible for people to avail of this exactly. unbelievable produce. Well, that's it, yeah, ma exactly. Make it accessible and make it possible, but also prove that it works and prove that like you can grow produce on an acre and there's a market for it and you can, as a farmer, have a living and also prove that you don't need to put chemicals and pesticides on food to make that farm profitable. It's something that's very important for, for us as a business is to work with farms who are taking care of the land and farms that are trying as, as much as possible not to heavily till their land and are growing multiple crops on their farm and are promoting biodiversity through, through hedgerows mm. or will have bees on their farm as well. But it all like it all works together, right? It's mm. like if you have if you have healthy one, land, it's one big ecosystem. Yeah, if you have healthy yeah. land and a healthy farm, and you have bees on your land, then your cucumber plants and your tomato plants are going to pollinate better, and it like it, it really does work together. Healthy soil is such a fundamental part of growing delicious produce, so it makes sense that Fergus is building relationships with growers who really care for the land. You're much less likely to throw something in the bin if you know the person that grew it, right? If you see Absolutely, a beautiful Romanesco yeah. sitting in the fridge and you're like, I know that Dermot hand harvested that from the field, mm. like it suddenly puts a whole new dimension to that piece of food. And yeah. you're, you're way less likely to, to throw it in the bin when you, yeah. when you know the person who put oh, absolutely. into The amount of time and effort it takes to go from seed to it's product mass. is, it's exactly. incredible. Like, <laughs> If you, if you knew the profitability in it, you'd never do it. Exactly but right. It, it's, it's, it's pure love. Farmers are incredible people. They're incredibly passionate people that, I mean, I feel very privileged yeah. to, to know. Um, and yeah, it's, it's about respect when it comes to ingredients. Exactly. Fergus and I hit the road to visit Ballon Carey Farm in Kildare to meet one of the growers, Dermot Carey. Dermot has vast experience of consulting with restaurants and hotels all over the country, helping them to grow produce on site that serves their menu. How many acres is it? 
he'll correct me. I think it's 10 acres in total. He's like, he's not okay. farming 10 acres, but I think the whole yeah. property is. I've been dying to meet Dermot. I was like a kid in a sweet shop as he gave us a tour of his farm. He has been consistently pushing the boundaries of what can be grown in Ireland and specializes in unusual and particularly Mediterranean veg, like Padron peppers, for example. Is this going to be hot or is it all right? It's a lucky mix. Roulette. What is it you said? One in ten is supposed to be spicy? One in ten and one in six. Is that one hot or mild? No, it's good. It's, it's good, good, yeah. yeah. We, we have some unusual... Oh, they're the aubergines? Are they? Aubergines here, aubergines, like yeah, egg, wow. egg colour, egg I've shape. Actually, I've only ever seen these in photos. They're, they're mature there now, at that oh, wow. size. But not to be eaten raw, I'm assuming, right? Uh, well, you tell me. You're the chef. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll test it. Um, Whoa. They're quite sweet. Are they, yeah? Yeah. Some of the varieties of stuff that you're growing tend, seems to be influenced more by the US as well. That's true, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's quite a lot of small scale, smallish scale growers in America. Mm. And they're growing on quite small, like I'm growing on 10 acres here. But you have some growers in America growing on less than an acre. Doing like that kind of micro uh, market garden kind yeah, of style. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. But flipping over the beds very quickly. Yeah. We caught Dermot on a busy day of harvesting, but we're happy to get stuck in as he casts some light on the various ways that sustainability has become ingrained in his practice. A lot of biodiversity here with the different types of weeds. Like, you know, even this time of year, like the end of October, we still have flowers. So that's, that's bound to be good for the insects and the bees. We keep the, the weeds at a certain level. But I guess in this situation, you're almost like you're working with nature rather than, than against it, right? That's true, yeah, yeah. And you're like, letting the weeds do their thing to, to a certain extent. We're planning to plant flowers and have a, yeah. a flower area because obviously that attracts in the likes of hoverfly, yeah. which feed on ladybirds and they Amazing. feed on the, the aphids. So it's, it's, it's exactly what you're saying. It's about keeping things in balance. They're a bit of a chef's dream, you know, they're kind of... They're, but take, you, take one or two back you, with you. And, you quickly, uh, you peel them fairly fast. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, it's nice. It's like <laughs> these really thin ones that like, take forever to peel. Do you, would you just bunch three of them now and put them? We'd, no, we'd get them bunched. Okay. They'd come to us bunched, yeah. Like yeah, if that was in a box, people would just, you know, that's, that's what makes the difference. And, isn't that's it? it, right? Exactly. I think it's, but it's, it's striking the balance between unusual veg and, and everyday veg. And this is a mix of both, right? So there we are. Yeah. For the best side out. <laughs> <laughs> This is the purple sprouting broccoli. And who introduced you to, to this one? Well, I, I probably started growing them on the Iron Islands. Um, wow. I was growing them on the Iron Islands, oh God, over, over 20 years ago. Wow. I used to sell this at farmers markets in Dockey and different places and that, and people would inquire about it and then, but if you mention the word kale, <laughs> yeah. So it was it, always Cavlo Nero. Nero that's that yeah. All right, give a recipe and gone, so exactly. Have you always been growing organically? Um, well, you're... no, I grew up on a conventional farm, 100 acres. We used to sell into the fruit and veg market in the wholesale market in Dublin. But my mother's family, they had the business in the market. Hmm. So my parents met at the market and married. Hmm. So I have on one side of the family, I have the growing. On the other side, I have the wholesaling. What caused that shift of mentality for you in terms of well, that shift, diversifying um, and, and turning <clears throat> to organic? I seen my dad, he was just conventional grower. It wasn't sustainable long term. Like I'm basically doing it all on my own, yeah, you know, yeah. so uh, I don't have the overheads. You know, I suppose my dad, he just found it difficult to compete with the imported veg. So I'm kind of proving that it, a lot of this stuff can be grown on site or grown in Ireland rather than imported. Mm. Do you believe there's a future in this form of farming? Do you think this knowledge that you have can be passed on to the next generation? Or, you know, how do you, how do you see it developing? I plan to have it like run like a model farm, run courses here and um, have different kind of growing systems. So you can show different like bed systems, drills, beds, and different kinds of equipment. Yeah. Like oh. even though I have an old classic David Brown tractor here, yeah. 1970. <laughs> I'm dying I have, to go see that. The, like, like the type of machines I have on the back of it are going to be yeah. fairly modern, you know. Or Will that be electric powered soon? Or? <laughs> I doubt it, no. <laughs> Spending some time with Dermot and getting to help out on the farm was a real privilege. He knows his business inside out. And whether it's through using biodegradable plastic to protect his crops, or choosing to farm organically to keep the soil healthy, he sees sustainable farming as the only option for growing healthy and delicious vegetables. He's a genuinely inspirational figure, 
And I'm not just saying that because he gave me something to take home. So I'm on my way to Neighbourhood Wine, where I'm going to meet Shane. I picked up some bits along my way. Some bread from Scale Bakery, some cheeses from Sheridan's, along with some of my own preserves. I look forward to seeing Shane sell some of the most amazing wines in Ireland. Really look forward to hearing how sustainability fits into his business model. How are things going for you? Good, good. It's been a hectic year. We've come into it and it's, I suppose it's been a dream for us to, to sell the wines we love from small producers, which is really important to us because a lot of the stuff we do would be organic, biodynamic, um, not out of any kind of uh, principle, I suppose, apart from really sustainability and making sure that the, the guys that we buy from are kind of custodians for the land rather than just, I suppose, you know, producers. You personally go out there and you, you, meet, you meet them. Yeah, a lot of them are mates because it's a small, uh, you know, fairly tight-knit community, especially, yeah. especially in the kind of wine that we like to bring in, um, which is, you know, it's very personal. Um, and a lot of them are very small producers. I got a tip from a guy in Paris um, who was really good sommelier. Um, and he basically said, look, you know, there's a small guy working about an hour north of Burgundy in a place you've never heard of called Champlit. And I was like, I've got to go see this. <laughs> and he went and taught himself how to make wine, came and propagated the vines from 85, and they've never been spread, sprayed at all. So, like, it's... Um, so he really knows what he's doing. Like, so you're getting, like, proper, properly made wine. Properly made yeah. wine with the intervention of nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and including this one without even sulfur. It's just grapes. Right. Um, so it's your romantic notion of wine. But that all aside, it's just yummy as well which yeah, is the most yeah. important thing. Yeah. yeah. It's no accident that delicious produce comes from independent producers, be it winemakers, cheesemakers, bakers, taking time in their craft to produce something that's both natural and that comes from a long tradition of working locally and sustainably. Shane and I shared a delicious wine La Charlatan, made by Killian, who works in the shop. To have that level of expertise from someone who's selling you a bottle, that's what really sets apart independent outlets like Neighbourhood Wine. The key thing is you're getting someone that has selected the wine in the shop um, and they believe in the wine and nine times out of ten they'll be supporting those small producers again or su supporting a small importer. I like to do the test of, you know, if you're away camping in the west of Ireland and you're so far away from an independent uh, shop um, and you end up in, in, a, in a big supermarket and look for a wine that's, that's sulfur free if possible, which, which increasingly there's more of, more available. Um, and that is just because it's not out of dogma about having sulfur or not. Um, right. It's about the way that the farmer has had to farm the grapes to go into that wine. Um, because they have to be organic or biodynamic or done in a sustainable way because they need that biodiversity um, in, the, in the winery to be able to produ produce it in that manner. In terms of the future of wine and talking about shops like yours or, you know, to supermarkets, yeah. where, you know, where's that, that happy medium or is there, is there a, a real positive future for wine in, in terms there of... There is, but I think it, it, the real positive uh, for, for wine at the moment is that it is becoming more local um, and people are seeing that and there's opportunities, you know, um, in, in, in countries that are close to us. Um, there's opportunities for different types of packaging as well that have a lower carbon footprint. So over the past few years, we've seen a wider acceptance of wine in keg for restaurants and also like uh, wine that's in, in pouches or cans. Um, which is, is, a, is a far better way, um, uh, I suppose, in terms of the carbon footprint from shipping, yeah. uh, weight-wise. I think that people have really started to you know, concentrate on where their food is coming from. And with that, wine, wine comes into that picture as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, the pandemic has had a huge influence on that. I mean, people really pay a lot of attention and are willing to pay that little bit more for food that, you know, they, they trust. Yeah. And they, they know about, they know and that it's been grown organically or, you know, like the farm yesterday with, um, with Dermot. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know that grower, you know how he's growing um, and you're putting a really good product into your body. Yeah. <laughs> like at the end of the day. You're taking a link out of the transport chain as well. Um, so it's not going from uh, farmer to warehouse to uh, distributor to truck to warehouse to truck to shop. 
you're, you're cutting a couple it's of quite links. A out. <laughs> there's, there's, there's so many, there's so many links in the chain that you know um, that you know whatever you can cut down on is good. But also you get to transmit the story of the grower um, and work with them year on year. So these are our tote bags, which we, we started with uh, last year. Um, obviously good for branding, but um, uh, we initially we thought, you know, merch was pretty hot in 2020, so um, let's make some tote bags. Um, <laughs> but we've given far more of them away uh, than we have uh, anything else. Uh, but it's great, like if a customer's gonna come in and pick up three bottles, um, it's great to have. Also as well, um, my daughter um, designed the back of it, so it has a personal touch as well. Came down one Saturday morning and uh, she was drawing this away on the kitchen table and said, there you go, Dad. And I just said, okay, I think we've got something. That's yeah. the one. It was great to see you opening when you did, like, like a year ago, and since then you've opened another two spots. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable to see that growth. Yeah, I suppose it, it, it is, it seems like a lot, but at the same time, we've, we've been sure to keep the model light since day one, right. because first and foremost, there'd been a trend in, in Ireland where off licenses, independent ones, um, had been, you know, generalist, they're kind of across the board in terms of spirits and beer and, and wine. A lot of them have really struggled over the years uh, with supermarkets getting bigger and taking a bigger market share. And uh, what had happened was you'd kind of end up with two things, so hybrid wine bar slash uh, bottle shop slash restaurant or yeah. and coffee shop and uh, and also you know a, a standard off license which is trading mainly on price so we didn't want to be either of those um, and the key was having shorter opening hours taking shops that, that we knew that we could run without too much energy as well so we don't um, uh, you know we, we, we really only have a couple of uh, fridges per shop um, it's, a, it's very light, it's a laptop. Uh, we don't even have a traditional till system and we have all the LED lights in, uh, in the new units as well. It's a reflection of our personalities and our staff that we want to make sure that we do things right. Um, and we're at the beginning of our, of our sustainability journey. There are real challenges in terms of wine um, and that does come down to the production slash shipping slash uh, glass bottle uh, thing. So, we, you know, over time want to make sure that at the very least our shipping uh, is, is carbon neutral. Uh, we're working on that at the moment um, and it's been a learning experience, to be honest. Um, even, you know, I think once you start to scratch away at the surface, you can see that a lot of uh, companies are, are producing ways, you know, like uh, one tree planted and, and, and a lot of things like that. When, you know, some trees that are planted in one part of the world don't capture one third of the carbon of another one planted in a different part of the world. Right. And starting to get into these little minutia uh, to work out how to be the most effective that we can. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much. Cheers. Pleasure as always.